BB Cafe on Target 84. I need more helium. Hang on. Welcome to the EV Cafe Pier at the AA at the Carter Academy Fleet Mobility Live, the Business Design Centre in Islington, live at the ITT Hub 2023. So let's go. No, fuck that. Who are the EV Cafe? They're a team of experts. Bunch of, bunch of legends. Crazy people. <laughs> These guys are on tour in 24, and I'll be there too. That's unusual. Paul didn't talk over this. That, that, this time, so. <laughs> but you did, so that's great. Go on, leave it to you, Johnny. <laughs> 15,000 now, people. 15,000, that's the next goal. So, hey, everyone. Welcome to the EV Cafe. I'm Johnny Berry, the head of decarbonisation for Nobu Vehicle Solutions. It's where I am today. But most importantly, your host for today's session, where we plug into the current wave of EV charging innovation. As always, joining me is your EV Cafe team, the kind of experts who know their amps from their owns and can differentiate a fast charger from a leisurely Sunday drive. Meet John Curtis, the EV Cafe Operations Director, Sarah Sloman, Chief Strategy Officer at Payfru, Paul Kirby, Kirby aka Kirby. Man Man, Kirby. Kirby, Kirby, <laughs> and at EV Essentials. And last and certainly least, Mr. Nigel Farage. I mean, Sam Clark is French. <laughs> um, if you watch TV news, then you'll know you'll get the reference. <laughs> but more importantly, they are the heart of the EV Cafe. They're the dream team for any electric vehicle trivia night, ready to share their insights as we navigate through the innovation shaping charging technology. Of course, we will be joined by our special guests today, sharing their insights in the world of EV charging innovation. They are David Rimmer of Schneider Electric, will share insights on sustainable energy management and smart charging. We have Mark Potter of Free TI Energy Hubs, who will discuss quick in integrations of renewable charging infrastructure for a unique proposition. Michael Braybrook from Zaptec will update us on charging tech transforming fleet operations. But before we get started and hear from our special guests, we just want to give a massive shout out to Payfruit, Zaptec, the AA, Plug Me In, Europe Car and Webfleet for powering our mission with their support. And without you, these sessions would simply not be possible. So um, uh, from all of the team, a massive thank you. And, and to Aveco too. And to Aveco, yeah. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> Um, so it's a new work, new work one. Um, so don't forget, if you want to uh, spark a discussion with your questions and ideas, then please do head over to Zoom, where you can engage in the chat box and answer, ask questions in the Q&A panel. Um, the link should be on our EV Cafe LinkedIn page, and I'm sure one of you will put it in the LinkedIn chat box as well. So let's kick off. Um, let's kick off with some electrifying questions for the team. I'll... Uh, Start with Sam for a change and ask Sam, what's the most exciting innovation you see on the horizon for public charging infrastructure? Blimey. Thank you, Johnny, for stitching me up right at the beginning. Pavement uh, charging. Innovation. <laughs> no, Lamp post. Definitely not street charging. <laughs> definitely lamp post. I, I, well, so, something that prevents Paul from interrupting would be a great innovation. I think if someone could, divide, could could invent that, that would be pretty handy. That would that would make us a lot more efficient. Uh, right, charging uh, charging infrastructure. I think probably Johnny the evol the evolution of the vehicles and the capability to take the sort of charge that the chargers can now deliver. So, I think that the vehicles are getting smarter, uh, ranges are getting bigger, the charging power is getting greater. Uh, but when we get down to the stage where we're, we're charging a car or a truck even in, in five or ten minutes, I think we're, we're, we're seriously winning. Um, and we're getting closer and closer to that sort of threshold, which is quite exciting. So there's lots and lots of different into innovation in the charging world with the smart charging and time of use and plug and charge and auto charge and, and ma many other types of technology. But I think the fundamental for me is if the vehicles continue to be able to take more power uh, in a shorter period of time. Um, then I think that will help with the conversion of, of the uh, of the Nigel Farage's sceptics that, that I had the uh, pleasure of the audience with last week. Thank you, Sam. 
Sarah, as the payment technologies evolved in public infrastructure, how do you see changes to charging stations improving the EV adoption journey and, and the journey overall, to be honest? Thank you. Stephen, just this morning, I uh, was part of a discovery session with Crown Commercial Service. And those that don't know, that's what supplies a lot of the local authority tender procurement portals. They're in a really interesting phase right now of trying to predict how the latest government legislation around the being able to pay contactless or RFID or and how this affects fleet. So ultimately, we have got, I just look this up, actually, £770 million pounds is spent every week on diesel and petrol today as it stands so every single week seven seven hundred nearly 800 million pounds a week on diesel and petrol so how it's companies like mine and others how do we help uh, to see how we're going to be paying for the kilowatt hour equivalent of that now at the moment obviously there's four main ways to do it at home at depot rfid contactless or a combination of all of the above very different in the petrol and diesel world so how do we get us to a place where that is as easy as it was for internal combustion engine for reconciliation for making drivers lives much easier without having to faff about with post pay receipt capture how do we make the VAT really clear and more crucially what responsibility is on the financial services industry my industry to solve that riddle for us is it really an infrastructure play or is it a software and technology play thank you Sarah I wonder how many kilowatt hours you can buy Grid for 770, <laughs> yeah, 770 million pounds. <laughs> Can you do this for deals, sir? <laughs> um, Always. Paul with, the, Paul, with the pace of advancements that you've heard from Sam and, and a little bit from Sarah, what would you say are the innovations in electrifying commercial fleets and um, pushing us uh, towards a faster adoption rate when it comes to electric vehicles, uh, commercial vehicles, shall I say? Well, well you, remember you, that, you remember that campaign that will be close to Sam and Sarah's heart, Think Bike. Well, we should be thinking van and thinking truck when it comes to the charging facilities, because actually all it needs is a little bit more thought. So innovation, yes, it's important. And, and there are some innovations coming. So look, there's a there's a battery that the, the van can pick up that is designed it, it, with its intent. It's not all the way there yet, but the design is that it can be plugged in and removed autonomously from the back of the van. It's a great thing. It's a company called Tool. Um, it's already been trialed, trialed by DPD and Ford, um, and that trial was deemed a, a success, and there are iterations that will, will come from that. And we'll see. D will it work? Will it not? Not sure, but it is looking like it's an innovation that's coming that is designed and specifically focused on the van world. Um, and, and of course, you know, I think, again, not necessarily innovative, but the the kind of hubs that are coming out of the ZHIB trial and other companies are bringing dedicated commercial charging hubs to the market um, that will resolve a lot of the issues, focusing on the driver, for instance, because the driver in the commercial world doesn't get that attention or that money that we do in the car world. So the benefit in kind benefits really give a lot of incentive for drivers to um, to move to electric, but we don't have that same incentive in the commercial vehicle world. So what can we do to incentivize drivers? So again, uh, setups that are geared around the driver are coming and uh, that will be a really positive thing. So there is innovation coming. Um, there, are, there is even moving you know, vehicles that can go and charge and do all of those kinds of things. But I think those, those are the things that are interesting at the moment. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that, Paul, because there's so many innovative ways to deliver electricity to the batteries now. Mm. <laughs> I counted over 20 use cases only recently, the power bank that you mentioned by Chul being one of them. Um, is it worth just mentioning the van plan that the EV Cafe was involved with um, a couple of weeks ago? It's also pushing the agenda towards uh, faster adoptions towards electric vehicle, commercial vehicles. Do you want to do the honours, Paul? Yeah, it absolutely is. I'm looking for my squidgy van, but I can't find it. But <laughs> because I don't, I don't eat the chocolate. Um, there it is. Uh, the the van plan chocolate. Um, there's a QR code there if you you can squid and get all the details of the van plan it we launched it at the uh at parliament the houses of parliament with an event where mps were able to drop in 
Johnny, you were there, um, you know, educating, engaging with some of the MPs. I've I've spoken to my local MP, Richard Fuller, who was able to get to that and has followed up with me on that. So that's really good. There is genuine engagement. We're seeing it from both sides of of Parliament in Labour. Bill Easterton is is very engaged with the same same plan. So the good news is that it's a simple three point plan with financial support, legislative support, and support around charging. Those are the three areas that we're asking. Uh, used vehicles is certainly a critical area, both, both for cars and for commercial vehicles in terms of that support that goes on. But it's a partnership between the BVRLA, Logistics UK, the AFP, REA, or Recharge UK, and ourselves. And we will be attending a round table with um, the transport... Oh, gosh, I've forgotten his name. Um, anyway... I'll know his name by the time we get there. Um, but one of the Bill. one of the ministers, um, and well, we're having a, a round table with him, with um, myself and and the, uh, Duncan Webb from the AA are going to go from our party, but a number of other people. So it's a continuous thing that will be going out throughout the year. So it's a really really good thing. I do wonder how you've still got that chocolate though. Oh, mine didn't make it out of London. So. <laughs> uh, John. Um, from your experience with uh, the Greenfleet EV Rally, um, which emerging technologies or innovations do you believe will supercharge public enthusiasm and accessibility for electric vehicles? I think the EV Rally does it on its own, if I'm really honest. And I think just seeing 100 people, 50 vehicles of all types, um, driving around the roads on social media, showing it can be done, covering 1400 miles in a week where all of us charge every single one of us gets through that challenge but what's really interesting this year is the breadth of vehicles that are available so you know we've been in at this for 12 years 14 years you know sam since he was a boy um and this year we're seeing not only cars vans and the smaller lorries we're seeing big trucks now we're seeing potentially electric motorbikes aren't we sam uh yes we are i mean we, uh, the, the innovation is everywhere it's really really good you caught me out there because someone waved at me through the window i know um, the timings everything in comedy yeah yeah well done john good work uh, but i was thinking about about what you said though and, and i don't wish to put negativity on on our topic here but we've also got to measure ourselves in regards to what innovation we're investing in right so um the innovation is fantastic. I love it. But at the same time, as I always shout about, it needs to be commercially viable. And, and we've seen, unfortunately, you know, British Volt, Lunas, Volta, Arrival, uh, Vetrix, Modec. There's many, many companies out there with really, really good engineering, innovative ideas, which are now, well, apart from the, perhaps the exception of Volta, no longer with us. Fisker nearly went under last week. Mm. So there's mm. lots and lots of really, really good stuff, but it's not commercially making sense. And, and that money not only is is unfortunately potentially going wasted it's also not being apportioned to the places that it could make a difference you know there's hundreds of millions that have been lost in areas that could have been invested in places that, that would have been more successful so i think there's a huge education piece that needs to be done amongst the investors the ones that are reaching their pocket and investing in this technology to make sure that we are putting money in the right places so that we can accelerate the change it's interesting you say that, Sam, because yesterday I was with Fiona Hislop, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport in Scotland, and I said to her, EHGV, massive project, £68, £69 million pounds of government money going into EHGV, and they're just cracking on with it. They're getting the job done. And it concerns me that the Scottish government, I said to her, you know, usually in policy terms, we would apportion 10% of whatever England and Wales apportioned for similar support. And she said, we have no plans to invest in EHGV in Scotland at this stage. We are doing more research. We've got a task force who's been challenged to find solutions that work. And immediately I became very frustrated because you and I both know that there are proven technologies in the marketplace that can be deployed now. And if we're going to um, move at pace and scale, that seed funding, that support needs to be made available. And I was fascinated. And, and I guess what you're saying is the same thing. We still need to know more about what will work and what won't, because there are too many people going to the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think you summarised it nicely. Thank you kindly. That's what I do for a living.
<laughs> yeah, so like, oh, I've had that. <laughs> well done. Um, so we could spend the entire day discussing this and innovations in the sector. However, it's now time to turn our attention to our first guest speaker, and we're already behind time. So I'll hand over to you, Sam, to introduce our first guest speaker for today. I can do. Thank you, David. Uh, when you when you're when you're ready, please do put your your uh, your video on. So David Rimmer, microgrid business leader for Schneider Electric UK and Ireland. David's focus is on leveraging digital technology with infrastructure to accelerate these changes. Prior to this, he worked as a project manager on large stadium and data center projects, and more recently as an account manager supporting his customers with utilizing digital tools and connectivity to drive operational and energy efficient efficiency in their buildings. This experience has given David a wealth of knowledge across the power distribution, energy management, and building control systems, and more importantly, um, how they can function as a complete solution to optimize energy usage across operations. And that's, I think, a key point uh, is the consolidation of all of those different bits of technology to make it work. Uh, I've just thrown that in, don't know why I did. Um, David has a master's degree in renewable energy engineering from Cranfield University and studied earth and environmental science as an undergraduate which makes him significantly cleverer than me. Uh, fun fact, he's so sustainable, he doesn't even drive at all, which is also commendable because that is miles not being consumed uh, on our roads by someone that's using presumably public transport, David, to get around as best as you can, right? Uh, but as best as I show. can, yeah. <laughs> as best as you can, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff, well, very, very much welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. What would you like to share with us today? So I guess if I do a, a quick, very quick overview of Schneider and kind of my role in microgrids, and then we can answer some questions and maybe make some time back. That sounds so, great, David. And just um, quickly, just as a reminder to all of the participants that are on today's show, um, please do the, use the Q&A tab if you have any questions for any of us or any of our guest speakers. And, and John will open the mail room very shortly. Best question, we'll win a mug. So uh, if that doesn't encourage you, then I don't know what will. <laughs> and it's an EV cafe mug. That's the one. Sorry, David. No, thank you. So Schneider are specialists in energy management and automation. Um, and what we're really trying to do is to empower everybody to make the most of their energy and the resources through digitization. So utilizing digital tools um, and electrification. So we're really trying to power the transition to what we're calling the new energy landscape. So within the context of um, e-mobility, um, what does this actually look like? So if we think about a charging hub, um, you're going to have a, a main medium voltage substation somewhere that could be filled with Schneider Electric switchgear. Um, that's then going to supply a, a low voltage substation with a transformer and a, an LV feeder pillar that's then going on to supply your um, electric vehicle chargers. And we do nice AC and DC chargers, but that's just on the hardware side, right? So um, what's really special and what's you know going to, to make this transition happen is the, the digital side. So we could also provide the controls and the automation systems to ensure reliable power, um, switching and load shedding to make sure that everything's safe and it, it's you know turned on when it needs to be turned on. Um, we could do the building controls. So if there are shops or offices on the premises, then we can ensure comfort and try to balance the power consumption within that site. Um, and we could also do a full kind of digital services package. So trying to move from preventative maintenance, so your bog standard once a year, go and turn it off and give it a dust, to predictive maintenance um, through you know, complete remote monitoring. So 24 seven monitoring of all of your assets. Um, so we really can do the, the full end-to-end -end solution. And I think when you look at some of the, the new policies that are going to be coming in um, around you know, um, uptime guarantees, um, maintaining that infrastructure, maintaining the reliability of that infrastructure is going to be critical. So I lead the microgrid business um, for Schneider across the UK and Ireland. Um, and all microgrids are, are local energy networks consisting of these things we call DERs, so distributed energy resources. And all that means is generation assets, so hopefully renewable generation assets, as you can see behind me, um, storage, so energy storage systems, and then flexible loads that we can control to, to shape when we're using that energy. Um, your microgrid could be, you know, in parallel to the grid or completely independent. Um, and really the benefits are around sustainability, obviously for going renewable, um, which is a, a nice big tick, but also that reliability and um, the resiliency aspects that comes from having that self-sufficiency um, and, the, and the storage on site. 
Um, and then also cost savings, because as we know, the price of energy um, has been increasing and might still continue to increase, unfortunately. So being able to generate some energy yourself um, and to utilize that where you need to um, really aids the, the access to energy. And so particularly with when we're talking about electrification, um, electric demand is going through the roof, as we know. And as we're looking to, you know, install more electric vehicle chargers, for instance, you might go and apply for a, a larger connection um, and get stuck in quite a long queue. Um, so how do we bridge that gap to really, you know, aid that transition and to speed up this process? And this is where I think microgrids can really come into it. So if you're able to generate, you know, some of that gap on site and utilize storage and some clever controls to make the use of it when you actually need it, um, that should minimize the risk and the, the impact of this electrification onto the grid um, and hopefully speed up the, the adoption of some of these technologies. Beautifully said. Now we've got one question in the Q&A. Have we got questions of our own as well? Oh, just going to say. Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll go so, to the EVP team first, shall we? <laughs> yeah, David, I, I've got a question, and that's you've done a massive, massive installation in Birmingham, uh, yeah. and that was just the best charging site I've seen deployed at that scale. Was it 120 charges in one site? Something like that, yeah. And and your role in that was to get that DNO connection all set up and, and organised. So it's the upstream um, electrical distribution infrastructure. So the, the feeder pillars that I mentioned um, and, you know, all of that, that switch gear. Um, so it's really just the, the connections down to the chargers. So what we do really well on that hardware piece um, is all of that switch gear, all of that, um, the infrastructure that, you know, surrounds the charger. So when people see a charging hub, you see lots and lots of charge, they think that's it. Well, actually, there's so much work to do kind of before you get to that point to actually make sure that you can plug it in and that it's going to work. Um, you know, from the design concepts all the way through. And were there particular challenges with that site that you had to overcome? So I actually didn't work on that site, so I don't know. I imagine, yes, they, they usually are. Um, what but, sort of things do you I, come I, up I against know. then? So typically, what sort of challenges do you come up against when you're, you're involved in connecting charges to the grid? Uh, at the moment, something I'm seeing quite a lot is um, export limitation agreements. Um, yes, you can, you know, install whatever you want, but you are not allowed to export. Um, and this is, you know, because um, the infrastructure just can't take that power back onto the network. Um, so when people are looking at installing generating assets, um, you know, to support um, what, I, what I just talked about, um, that's all well and good, as long as you can guarantee that nothing goes back onto the grid. Um, and that can cause a bit of a headache. Thank you. Yes. Paul well, I was I was going to put because I recognised Sarah was going to speak. So I um, recognise she... Sarah as well. She's yeah, <laughs> green. Like, she's that one. Um, green looks orange to me. Gosh, wow. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Paul's colourblind. You know, it's it's, yes. it's extremely extremely green. It's very very green. Okay. <laughs> Good. Well, go for it, green girl. Thank you. So I'm glad you raised that point because we talk a lot about fleet depots having a unique scenario whereby you can utilise lower cost lower charging power, meaning you can pick and choose when your vehicles are charged and pre-program everything with software. Great. However, some of these generation assets, particularly the battery energy storage systems, are met with such concern, whether that's the cost it is to install them or buy them versus what you just articulated there, which is a fear around that energy being discharged and sold back to the grid. What are you seeing from fleet managers from this perspective? Have you managed to get to talk to anyone who is deploying the whole ecosystem on their site or are they relying on you guys as a sort of external consultant to advise? What's the what's the flavor like out there? It's a bit of both. Um, we do do a lot of that kind of external consultancy. Um, so. It's really project by project, site by site. Um, it is, the isn't it? Restrictions mm. are, are very special to, to each individual. Um, in some cases, so batteries, as we know, are, are still quite expensive. The prices are coming down, um, but they are very expensive. Um, that is a, a blocking point. Um, but there are ways that you can kind of, you know, generate additional revenue from installing these assets on your site if you're able to take part in bridge flexibility services. So not only does that, you know, improve the, the return on the investment, um, you're also actually helping to support that local network. So if there are capacity constraints, um, you know, you could actually take your site offline for a period of time, be paid to do so. It's going to, you know, partially fund some of that battery. But you're also you're, you're helping that network. So, you know, you're not putting other consumers that are on that network at risk of, of a blackout um, just because you want to charge your, your fleet of vehicles. 
Superb. Thank you. Johnny's on mute. Johnny's on mute. Johnny's on mute. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear me talk, so I have to mute myself. Thank you very much for that, David. Um, I particularly liked the emphasis on the importance of maintenance um, I was to ensure that, that uh, you know, charge remain operations is super important, particularly when it comes to fleet operations. So um, unfortunately, we have a tight agenda, so we'll have to say goodbye for now. Um, but we, we look forward to work, having you back on very, very shortly mm. to assist in answering some questions. So please don't go anywhere. Mm. Just turn your camera off now. But no in the meantime, we are going to take a moment uh, for a very special tribute. Um, I'm going to let Paul Kirby uh, take it from here. Thank you. Uh, John, are we rolling? Yeah, with a bit of luck, that should be. So in case you didn't know, uh, this is Tim Evans, or this was Tim Evans. Tim sadly passed away last Tuesday evening uh, in a positive note, surrounded with his family um, at his bedside and so on like that. Tim has been a huge character in our industry. And I got to know him, um, his his kids, or he went to college where my kids went to college, and we, we kind of just instantly kind of connected and got chatting and I've been able to have dinner with him and just spend time with him and I was shocked devastated really and I didn't really even understand the level of the connection that I'd felt with him he felt such a pioneering and inspiring figure a challenging figure as well and not afraid fearless in fact fearless when it came to calling anybody out about anything and it didn't matter what the subject, if he had a different opinion, he was happy to say it, no matter who was listening. And I take some inspiration from that because he was hugely brave in that respect. But what I also loved about him was his immense sense of fun. The sense of fun that would, uh, he was a singer, he was, he danced as well and had been acting and, uh, but also all of his life, or certainly for 40 years, had been diagnosed with bipolar mm -hmm. as well. Um, and there's there's an opportunity to um, give if you go to Tim's page on LinkedIn. You can uh, give to support bipolar in his memory. But Tim lived for two things within 3TI. And first of all, he wanted to give everybody the opportunity to drive on sunshine, a registered trademark. How he managed to achieve that, I don't know, but he did. Um, that is just a fantastic thing. And with the solar car parks that have been deployed in JP Morgan and Bentley and Eastbourne Hospital and Salisbury and other places around the country, people are able to um, mitigate their energy demand through uh, the, the services that they provide and also be able to charge on pure solar. But also they've got the Papio 3, which is a hybrid solution of grid and solar. Uh, and, and that comes good, too. He was innovative. He saw the future. And simply, he wanted to leave something better behind. And the reality is, Tim, you really did leave something better behind. Something better behind in 3TI, something better behind in the inspiration and encouragement you've been to us all. Thank you, Tim. All right, that's lovely. Thank you for that, Paul. Um, so, as a as a as a lovely segue, really, into that tribute from from Paul in regards to Tim, uh, we have the pleasure this this week of, of Mark Potter, uh, who is from Three Ti, Chief Technical Officer, in fact. Um, and uh, and Mark, I know it must be incredibly challenging and a difficult time for you. Um, so it's it's with great um, gratitude that we welcome you onto our show today, knowing how difficult it must be uh, in what is incredibly challenging time. Um, but we must move on, and we will, all of us generally, um, as well as on our webinar. Um, so uh, with that in mind, I will try to uh, do my justice in introducing your good self. So Mark is a technical leader with 20 years experience in aerospace, EV automotive and infrastructure businesses. He joined 3TI as CTO, Chief Technical Officer, in 2021 to maintain 3TI's position as the UK's leading solar car park company through innovative, scalable, market-leading and globally applicable technologies that use solar, battery and EV charge pointers to optimise existing site grid connections. I think the picture in your background summarises even better than I just tried to articulate. Um, today, Mark is heading up the exciting new 
Papilio 3 V2X Fast Hub project, easy for me to say, uh, to demonstrate how electric batch vehicle batteries can be used to smooth out the peaks in supply and demand to balance the UK's electricity grid. Now, fun fact, I will bet my butler's salary that John Curtis will not be able to keep a straight face as I read out the next sentence. Uh, I would like you all to listen very carefully at Mark's fun fact. I can, honestly, I can barely say I'm reading this out. It's amazing. Okay, he once went on tour with Bodger and Badger as Badger's fluffer. <laughs> if anyone needs tips on extracting mashed potato from fur, he's your man. Uh, and it's really quite wonderful that I've got to this point in my career that I have been able to say things like that in front of several hundred people. But um, Mark, thank you very much both for giving us the introduction and that wonderful fact. And John Curtis is indeed smiling, so that's good. Um, but welcome, as always. Um, and uh, yes, thank you very, very much, as I said at the beginning, uh, for your time and effort today, especially these difficult times. So, so very, very welcome. Um, and thank you for spending some time with us today. Thank you for the, the welcome. And I think we might have broken John there. Um. <laughs> so I can't even begin to tell you how hard that was. That is the best fun fact we have ever oh, had. Ever had. Yeah. And Mark, before you start, can you just answer Michael Barton's question? He says, what is your top tip for removing mashed potato from fluff? <laughs> My concern is, why does he want to know? But go for it. <laughs> I don't want to ask that question, but I shall answer the question in the best way I, I can, okay? Prior preparation prevents poor performance. The key <laughs> is the mix to start off with. Underwater, <laughs> the mashed potato is actually smash. Underwater, the smash. So it starts off really dry. That's the top tip. This is good to know. <laughs> wow. There we go. Now I've got the theme tune stuck in my head for the entire duration of this. Everybody knows. <laughs> right, thanks for having you on, Mark. <laughs> thank you. And, and, and thank you, Paul, for, for the tribute to Tim. You know, it has been um, a hell of a week. It was only a week ago, almost to the hour, that um, that, that we learned the news um, about Tim, and it has been a very difficult week. But um, Tim, uh, as as you all know, was absolutely dedicated to um, the mission to democratisation of energy, to, um, to try and leave a better planet behind. And, you know, these aren't just corporate slogans. These are his words um, that got people like me engaged in the business. Um, I, I can barely believe it's only about two and a half years ago. Um, but, but, but you know, got everybody backing him. And there's been such so much love, so much support that's been coming in. Uh, on the channels on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, his from his personal life, uh, from from his professional life, you know, um, it's been it's meant an awful lot to us, um, and you know, we're absolutely dedicated to to continuing that journey, continuing that mission, not just his mission, but in his spirit. Okay, mm. with that bit of fun, with that little bit of mis mischievousness, uh, <laughs> if necessary, with mashed potato. <laughs> well done, mate. Seriously, Thank you, uh, most people will be broken, I think, today. Uh, and here you are um, doing the thing that you were put on this planet to do. So thank you from all of us. So, Mark, do tell us, um, what is the V2X project and how is it going to make a difference? So hopefully um, everybody's seen one of these things um ideally in the flesh these uh, papilios that sits, sits behind me here at the moment um v2x is basically making a bi-directional charging version of one of these so the standard papilio is 22 uh, kilowatt 12 or 12 22 kilowatt charge points on it we're making a bi-directional one which has got 12 uh, dc um v2x compatible um 30 kilowatt charge points on it wow and 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 how do you see this kind of rolling out? What 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 is the the ultimate goal for the project? So uh, um, you'll know that we're kind of really active in the workplace and destination market. Um, one of the environments where where V two X is going to become commercially viable um, at kind of the earliest opportunities is going to be in the fleet space. We think. Um, Kind of mass market, uh, uh, kind of domestic is is coming as as you hear a lot about. But 
that what this project does is it creates um you've heard about microgrids already it creates a dc microgrid actually it creates a dc microgrid within an ac microgrid if you want to get geeky about it and um you better stop me when i when i do <laughs> um but what what it does is it creates a very uh a, a big value stack okay you can't look at at the value stack in isolation you can't just look at revenue you can't just look at infrastructure costs you can't just look at i don't know battery degradation or whatever else you've got to look at the whole value stack so what we've created in v2x is a product which um has a broad value stack and releases value at each one of those levels whether it's the grid services whether it's the microgrid components whether it's the infrastructure whether it's the grid upgrade costs and um, whether it's the uh the rate at which charging can be done 30 kilowatts and 15 kilowatts for discharging um those things all add together to something that creates a commercially viable whole and you know if there's one thing that that uh <clears throat> that tim is, is famed for it's it's pushing harder it's going faster okay we're all about accelerating that energy transition and this is a product which accelerates the energy transition by accelerating the transition to bi-directional charging fantastic and i think that's an important point isn't it there's a couple of questions around what, what vehicles are available to do bi-directional charging obviously that gives you a challenge and also people talk about the cycles you know the, the amount of cycles a battery will go through and i know that you know from chatting with you previously that there is some really interesting kind of um, thought that's coming from that and how that might help as well so maybe you can touch on those two things yeah well let, let's start on the, on the availability of vehicles uh, and i'll try not to get too much of my soapbox um so there's two ways of doing bi uh, bi-direction you've got ac bi-directional where the vehicle charger the one that's on the vehicle itself generates the ac that goes out to grid the other way is dc bi-directional where the charge point the wall box is the thing that turns it into ac um, and so you pull it out of the vehicle in DC. From a vehicle availability compatibility perspective, DC V2X has been around for quite a long time, uh, probably about a decade now, in the form of Nissan vehicles, uh, ENV uh, and, and the uh, and Leaf. Um, so that's why almost all those bi-directional trials have been done on those vehicles. CCS bi-directional has been incredibly slow to come, incredibly slow, and it's taken a very long time uh really because of um oems and everybody trying to get a slice of the pie okay as soon as people start realizing the opportunity that bi-directional presents the amount of uh of of um whether you want to think of it as revenue or saving opportunity everybody wants a slice of that big pie um and it's really damaging what we really need to do is make this go faster <laughs> so there are some zcs vehicles coming with support some sort of declaration of support but the standards were only signed off a year ago compatibility is going to be a problem for some time my soapbox and i'll try not to stay on it too long is unlike ac v2x you don't need different hardware on your vehicle for dc v2x dc v2x is just software okay when you've got a dc connection between your charger and your vehicle the thing that controls which direction that that energy moves in is the charger V2X support from the vehicle just needs it to talk to the charger and allow it to happen. So there is nothing from a technical perspective stopping every CCS vehicle that has already been deployed, that's already been rolled out, being given a software upgrade that makes it a bi-directional vehicle. Now that's quite different in the AC space, okay? And those big delays getting vehicles into uh in, into that bi-directional support has and and, and uh, the signing off the standards it's really been about the oems trying to take a slice of the pie and they're using arguments like well we've got to put more expensive hardware on our vehicles to support it no they don't okay second oems are putting more expensive hardware on a vehicle as an excuse to justify starting up their own energy companies so that they can control what goes in and out of the vehicles you know unfortunately what they're doing really is just trying to supplant the servicing revenue they used to get from their you know combustion engines and they want some kind of retained interest in a vehicle that generates more money throughout its life so it's been really unhelpful for those oems to look at it in that way it's been really holding back the industry um and you know it is a tragedy that europe is going to be so far behind the bi-directional curve and i hope that the work we're doing on this project will help accelerate it and if there's anything that anybody in the on the on the chat on listening to the cafe here anybody involved in 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 this 
in this network can do. It's, you know, let's push through DC bi-directional support from OEMs. Retrofit every new vehicle, you know, these are things which we've stopped short of in regulatory frameworks at the moment after a decade of messing around. And we've got to really try and change that direction. Mark, I was on my side. And I haven't even asked about, about battery de degradation yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, heck, it, we can actually improve improve batteries, let, let alone de degradate them. But um, a quick question for you, for you, Mark, and, I, and a bit of a challenge as well in, in whether you can do this in perhaps a sentence or two, is that there'll be lots of people in the audience that will understand bi-directional, V2G, V2X, V2H, um, V2B, etc. Um, there will be some that won't have a clue what you're talking about. So I just wondered whether or not it's possible that you could just summarise what vehicles, however you think it's yes, best to no, summarise no, vehicles. Absolutely fair point. Yeah. In, in very layman's terms, what does it mean? And, and Johnny, get ready so you can snip this for later. But what, <laughs> what does vehicle to grid or vehicle to X or bi-directional charging mean in, in layman's terms? Yes, yeah, so I mean, V2X is, 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 a, um, is kind of an encompassing all catch-all term, okay? You, you, you may have heard of V2G because that was being talked about for, for over a decade, but there's more to V2X uh, sorry, than V2G. So V2G means vehicle to grid, and normally that means power out of the vehicle reaching the grid, and you start thinking about national grid and national grid ESO and trading at that kind of level. Actually, um, V2B would be vehicle to building, um, you've got other terms like vehicle to infrastructure, you've got V2L, vehicle to load, which just means it's not actually connected to the to national grid in any way. You've got V to V, which is a kind of thing that we're, we're starting to introduce, vehicle to vehicle. And this is where on a system like a DC microgrid that we have in Papilio 3, you can move energy from one vehicle to another vehicle without it traversing the AC grid at all. That's got massive efficiency uh, benefits and, and um, infrastructure cost benefits. So V to X is a collective term describing about five or six different ways of taking energy out of the vehicle and into something else. Brilliant. Thank you. Mark. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Perfect for YouTube shorts later on as well. <laughs> so. That wasn't um, one sentence though, was it? Sorry, Johnny. <laughs> no, no you, you did fail, but the last two sentences did do it really well. So thank yeah. you for that. It's brilliant. I'll have to test my editing skills out later, Mark. <laughs> um, thank you ever so much for that, Mark, uh, particularly the important insights into the OEM world. So I do thank you for being in your soapbox there. It's really interesting. Um, it, what you and your team are doing with the Pilio 3 is truly exciting. I think it presents a great option for rapid deployment without permanent alterations at locations. Um, and uh, it's making it ideal for situations like uncertain leases or implementing infrastructure at customer sites, not their own fleet sites. So, and of course, addressing power constraints. So, really exciting innovation for like, the fleet market, fleet industry. Now, before we delve deeper into questions for you and our other guest speakers, it is time to introduce our final guest speaker for today. So over to you, Sam. Um, thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, so Michael, when you're ready, please, please do turn your video on. Uh, so Michael Braybrook is leading Zaptec's UK business with offices in London, Glasgow, and Manchester. Uh, his focus is on commercial and operational activities around 7 kilowatt go charge or 7.4 kilowatt, I should be precise, uh, go charger and 22 kilowatt commercial three phase charging known as the Pro. Zaptec is a respected member of the global EV charger manufacturing community, serving eight European countries and partnering with suppliers in 10 others. He's passionate about the transition to electric fleets and dedicated to driving this change along Zaptec, alongside Zaptec, sorry. Right, fun fact, I like this one, and I shall explain why briefly afterwards. Uh, fun fact, he's a big fan of classic cars and plans to convert an old Aston Martin DB9 to electric. And the reason why I love this, Michael, is because one of my bucket list um, requests to myself is to convert an AC Cobra uh, to electric, and then I want to call it DC Cobra. Um, so <laughs> that's on my bucket list. At one point in the future, um, I will have my electric Cobra. Um, and I will probably hopefully have built it myself too. So, so uh, I hope we both uh, get to meet someday in the future and drive around in our classic electric cars. That will be fantastic. But over to you. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. We are very short for time. I apologise. That's the, that's the curse of coming on last. But uh, please do share share with us what you wanted to share. Um, but we are going to have to be quite quick on timing. But welcome. That's great to hear. Thank you. Um, and actually, yeah, I should probably call it the Aston Martin DC9, shouldn't I? 
along with there yours. There you go. There you um, go. <laughs> it, it was basically that that idea came about. I've um, I've been a fan of cars since I was a young boy, and a lot of people were kind of this purist, realist kind of thing about, you know, what's what should you do? And from my point of view, you know, that we need to transition to electricity as quick as possible. Um, but the the sheer speed you can get from electric cars has just had me at day one. And I would <laughs> love to see, I think it's an old, couple of old films, like uh, there's, a, there's a film with um, Gattaca where they all drive electric cars, um, old classic Rovers and things like this. It, it pivoted me off there, but um yeah, without getting stuck into my into my kind of passions of having electric classic cars, um, my day to day sees me um, sort of steering the helm for Zaptec in the UK. Um, we've we've been in the UK for just over two years, um, and I joined the company last year. A lot of our kind of focus has been in uh, built environment, um, domestic charging. Um, other kind of key areas that we, fleet was the one thing we weren't really um, taking a, a, a steps in the right direction to kind of join that that type of conversation. And one of the key things we kind of pride ourselves as Zaptec is our our patented load balancing technology. And in a nutshell, what it does is it allows you to get the most out of the power going to any particular site. You know, so you can understand if you have three phase power going into a commercial site, you have X amount of charges set up there. You have X amount of them using power at the right time. This allows us to take all of the power and put it into the cars that need it straight away. And as we kind of evolve these kind of conversations, it, it ties in really nicely with the sustainability angle. You know, I think studies have come out saying that 90 percent of the, the grid in Europe needs to be expanded in order to kind of um, scale up for, 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 for more charging within both commercial and, and domestic kind of scenes. And, and our technology allows us to get more out of that with using less materials. So like less copper, less other minerals are kind of involved. And it, I think it, it, it speaks volumes to the way that the fleet is seen as not only a fantastic way to evolve, um, you know, the largest car buying part of, of, of the UK, but also it, it goes a long way to kind of ticking the sustainability boxes that businesses are being asked to, to focus on even more. Um, and all the things that we see this kind of working is it's, it's, yes, it's kind of working with facilities management companies who are in charge of commercial sites. It's allowing them to, to look at our systems, which are, which are really easy to, to install, but you can also scale. But also working with, with, with fleet companies where we're seeing the, the idea that chargers are bought alongside a car and installed at home and running on a, a separate tariff. Um, and I love that because not only does it um, promote um, a, a really nice way that, that, that businesses can um, involve things, but you know we've seen it happen with commercial uh, vehicles as well where they install chargers at home so that people aren't having to go to depots in potentially a, a, a fuel car to pick up a car to then go and do their job and be on the road and we see all the traffic being clogged up we kind of reduce that congestion and by having these kind of methods in place it really allows us to um, make charging and make uh, commercial fleets as well as domestic fleets a lot more palatable um, and our biggest kind of um, examples of this are working with fairly well-known household brands, which are electrifying their fleets. You know, we're now also seeing the return from some of those early adopters, putting those vehicles back into the used car market. And I think that the birth of the, the second-hand electric vehicle is, is something which keeps the electric electrification in the UK growing, even if, you know, new cars are having you know ups and downs in terms of sales figures the people who are kind of becoming electric through work or through the secondhand car market uh, are on the up and you know that kind of fits in a lot to our kind of overall um passion here at zaptec and i'm not sure if people are aware but we are um started in in stravanger in, in norway which is is the home of oil and gas in norway and to see that you know this particular region pivoted to um, embrace electric vehicles and, and charging, you know, 
quite a long time ago shows that the 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 overall kind of messaging and the overall changes that we're we're all seeing um are coming from places of, of of real expertise in those types of traditional energy production fields and that's kind of our commitment i think really to to um to fleet is that we come from a, a heritage place that we are looking to evolve and also make it you know scalable and um something that you can um, have a certain level of, of understanding and quality with. Um, I think the biggest kind of things that are, are challenges for, for fleets are there's still the range anxiety, there's still um, elements of, of, of how do we get the most from the current infrastructure that we have. Um, and I love the stats that come out, you know, about the average, you know, commute time is about 38 miles um, a day for people in the UK. So, you know, you, you don't actually need to be plugged in for that long to top up and charge up workspaces and and domestic spaces at home um so you know that's kind of where we kind of see ourselves working in fleet um we're also working with lots of kind of large installation companies now who traditionally have maybe seen things in a, in a more um domestic only uh, setting um we're now starting to see more and more electrification of car parks and uh, large organizations looking to to start their fleets um and you know i think the, the sheer um impact of, of of having lower um bills for for companies along with uh, an easy route to sustainability that's the the kind of the, the the golden um the golden channel we're looking for really when it makes sense on as many levels as possible and and that's our that's our main kind of goal is to support people within that um that uh, journey um one of the things we've we've, we've launched um, is an academy um, which is a great resource for um, people who are making the transition into doing the larger scale commercial and and, and fleet uh, electrification projects because you know we, we appreciate these are first still for lots and lots of organizations and companies and that shared knowledge that experience that we've got from you know numerous countries where we've been um operating similar systems for many years now it allows us to kind of share that and make it easy to support people in that journey um and it's it's something that we really really like um you know obviously um there's still grants available in this sector as well which is which is kind of key but i think the know-how and the understanding how best to do this this is this is how we really see electrification being um, widely adopted is if we can support people with those early uh, questions and layouts of uh, designing products that's our, our kind of key thing to it i hope that kind of gives you a, a good over round kind of feeling of what we're doing here at zaptech yeah that was great michael thank you for that um before we go on um could i please ask that david and mark also return online for the final round of q a session so um yeah and then over to you john to also open up the mail room for the last eight minutes of our session thank you now sarah you were waving do you have a question no i was waving at people coming back on screen <laughs> oh isn't that nice <laughs> she's sweet Hello. i've i've got a question michael which is you spoke it may have been before we started about some patented load balancing mm. uh, uh, um, software that you have can you explain what that does yes so uh, essentially it's about using the three phases um when you're plugging into a, a 22 kilowatt charger um what we're able to do is use all of those um phases of, of power and uh, allow a, a grid so that say for instance if you had 12 chargers in a in a, in a say, commercial setting historically if you don't have load balancing you would just take the power that comes into that particular um uh, premises and you would just equally kind of split it rather the the charges are being used or not with our technology whatever whatever's plugged in we're able to send maximum amount of power that's going to that unit to those particular vehicles um it's something we see in hospitality settings that works really really well um you know you're at a hotel you've got 12 charges or something set up there's guests coming in they'll plug their cars in maybe they've actually only need they've only got 30 miles <laughs> uh, that they've expanded on their journey here so once that charge is finished it allows that um power to then be available to any of the other cars which are put in and we see it working in 
uh, especially in, in kind of light commercial vehicles who are doing multiple jobs and they're, they're able to plug in and move in and out and you get the most from it without having to expand the grid or the power going into that particular site. Understood. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, there's a, a load of questions in here from Ian Thompson. And I know Ian's had to run because he's got uh, some duties elsewhere. But one of the questions, Mark, I think, is for you. And he asks, what are the solutions to the challenges of cross-billing to sell power from an EV? Any thoughts? Mm. <clears throat> I don't think I'm the best person to answer that question because... Is there anybody who is? Well, it's 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 a bigger issue with um, with with AC. Remember, I said lots of people trying to get mm. a slice of the pie. Mm. Okay, the way that that we are tackling the problem is to avoid that problem entirely. So you know, it's the asset owner, um, the charge point owner, rather than the vehicle which is in control um, of of the billing uh, stack, for a better word. So it, it, that cross billing problem is it is a, it is a thing, but um, it's not your thing. It, it's it's less of a thing if you do it the way we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Uh, Catherine Brandt uh, asks a question about. She says, "GB Energy, good or bad for V two? Um, and I'll be honest, I don't understand the question. If I'm I honest, I don't either. <laughs> no, no, I mean, like GB I News, good one. or bad for Sam? You know. Oh, GB News was very good for Sam because it was that <laughs> opportunity to show just how great he yeah. is or how much he grates. I'm so not is, sure. is that a question about Grid Beyond? Because our, our partner on the project is Grid Beyond. So Ooh. I don't know if that's who they're referring oh, to. Oh, maybe, maybe it's it's an abbreviation. Well, we don't allow those anyway. We're not um, allowed acronyms at all. Yeah. The latest so, new GB Energy. Yeah. It, 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 is there another company called GB Energy? There's lots of people in this space at the moment, okay, because what you're really doing is aggregating lots of capacity into a uh into an asset that you can trade um and there's lots and lots of people in the space we heard david talk about it earlier um there are people who are there's uh uh companies like ev miles who are doing it at like, the charge point level there are companies uh who are doing it um i dare say surreptitiously you don't actually know they're doing it on your behalf uh there are oems trying to get a slice of the pie through aggregating you know all of their vehicles together um there's mm. companies like renault who have decided that you have to have a renault charge point to be compatible with your renault vehicle and then they're going to trade the energy on your behalf and give you some kind of slice of the pie that way so it's 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 a bit of a wild west at the moment mm. my view is if you want to make it commercially viable have as few layers in that few, few many people you know dipping mm. into that as possible um mm. you're trying to whoever owns the asset should be the one that gets the money for the asset yeah, and that's an argument around warranties, but it doesn't stack up. The battery mm. degradation argument does not stack up. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of a lot of fud, a lot of misdirection, a lot of um, you know um yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of misdirection at the moment in the industry. Mm. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Um Sam. Uh, John, I just wanted to answer your the first question as well, just to support with, with Mark's point. Um I, I had I used to have a, a fleet of vehicles which ran off of V to G chargers. Um, and one of the ways to avoid the cross charging of, of energy bills is, to, is, as you said, to not do it. So in my case, it was vehicle to building such that the, all the energy we were extracting out of the vehicle was simply powering the building. So it didn't need yeah. to be offset because it was just taking that energy. And so in other words, you're just not consuming energy somewhere else Understood. as opposed to cross. So that's one way of sim simplifying the process is just to use the energy for your own consumption for the things that you would otherwise have used the grid for uh, and that that's one very simple way of, of keeping those two things uh, mutually exclusive that's very yeah, helpful but all of our stuff is behind a meter yeah yeah that makes absolute sense now i've got that uh ian thompson asked a question which i think david rimmer may well be able to help with i know mark could as well and that's around how you define a microgrid so david what do you mean by microgrid? So, um, so I think, yeah, the question, how small do things need to be? As small as you like, it could just be a building, it could be the business park. But if you have that local network, that when you've got some sort of generating assets, um, you could then have some storage and you've got the ability to control the loads and to control those assets. And that's what we would class as a microgrid. So no kind of, you know, minimum size or maximum size, really. It's just 
are you confined within the boundary and you can act as a, a prosumer rather than just a consumer. Brilliant. Thank you. And we've got some clarity on the GB Energy point. The Labour Party will create Great British Energy, a new publicly owned clean energy company. So thank you to Matthew Ling, Catherine Bryant and so on. Um, sorry, Catherine Brandt. My apologies. My grandfather was a Bryant and I keep saying Bryant. I do apologise. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the Labour Party. Great British energy. Who knew, eh? We're that close to a general election and we're like in this marketplace and we didn't know about that. Yeah, sorry, yeah, well, I, I didn't know about it by name. <clears throat> I, I, I'd heard of the uh, of the plan. I've just I've just forgotten the name. Yeah, no, I, uh, I haven't crossed my desk. Sorry, Johnny, you were saying. We're, we're we're out of time, but we have one more question. So can we squeeze an answer in before we close today's session? I don't yeah. know where the hour's gone, but. So, Ian Thompson, what movement is there on vehicles other than Teslas being automatically recognised by chargers so that you can plug and charge with no cards, no swiping, no nothing? Michael, any thoughts? I, I, could probably I understand. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, I understand my colleague from Navuna is the best person to answer this question. No, I was gonna... <laughs> um, I, I understand that it's it's very much a case that we have to have the OMEs to open up their systems, allow us to have that information, and then we can create something to it. And I don't think that they really want to, to share that at the moment. However, that that's information. I think the last time I answered this question was probably about six months ago. So I definitely open the floor up if there's further information. Yeah, I was just yeah, you're quite right there, Michael. Um, but I. Everyone's referring to the ISO 15118 as the standard communication between the electric vehicles and the charging infrastructure to facilitate such an experience like plug and charge, but also what uh, Mark's mentioned earlier about bidirectional charging and integration with EVs into the smart grid. So, yeah, uh, ISO 15118 is, um, is hopefully the future that's going to drive that experience. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. So I just want to say, oh, <laughs> not before you go, the winner of the mug is going to be Catherine Brandt because, one, she's looking for a new job and we want to support you in all of that, Catherine. So go get them, kid. Uh, and the other thing is that she brought us something that none of us really were able to say, oh, I know what that is. So we learned something today. Catherine Brandt, well done. Get in touch and we'll send you an EV Cafe mug with love. Thank you, John. Just want to end by saying a massive thank you to David, Mark and Michael and for all of those that participated on today's session. Um, and finally, please make sure you register for next month's session and don't forget to follow us on uh, LinkedIn or any social media channels for updates. And remember, every Friday morning, you can catch up with us on the latest news hosted by the amazing JC, John Curtis. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. It's been a great session with lots of great insights. Thank you all. Thanks all. Check out Thank the latest you. podcast Thanks, with Mike Cuts from Aveco as well. See you, See you later. Friday. See ya. Bye.